before we get started tonight, I was hoping to maybe get a sense of where everyone is because we can run these presentations any number of ways and it's sort of silly to just go through with a standard script uh, if we're not all in the same place. So the hope is to make this educational and beneficial and enjoyable for everyone. So maybe start off with a brief poll for how many of us are using JBoss application server and Wildfly. How many of us are using Java EE? Let's start there. Good number. Uh, and uh, the JBoss application server and Wildfly? Uh, JBoss application server five, six, AS seven, uh, Wildfly. Uh, does it then make sense to say that uh, if we were to start talking about Wildfly, we could start at the beginning and, and talk about Wildfly as an application server? Would that be beneficial to folks? Some nods. What else are we using? And you can shout it out. I, I don't mind. I'm sorry? Web logic? logic? Glassfish. Glassfish. Cool. All right. Um, I'll keep the bulk of what I do kind of generic to Java EE, um, and we'll loop in some of the technologies that we have at JBoss, because uh, that's what I'm familiar with, mostly. Um, and when Arun comes up, he'll come and maybe speak a little bit more about Wildfly specifically and we can dig into the runtime there. So um, working under the assumption that we're all kind of Java EE developers, something that's very near and dear to my heart is approaching development from a testable perspective. To me, testing is development. It is the engine that drives that what I'm doing is valid and it's correct and it looks right and it'll stay that way throughout the course of development. So um, my name is Andrew Rubinger. Uh, I have been at JBoss now for about six and a half years, and I started off on the application server team writing our EJV container. Um, and from there, realized that maybe things weren't as usable and testable as I wanted them to be, so started to work on a project called Shrinkwrap, which we'll see in a little bit. And from there, also started working on a project called Archilly. And when we start coupling those with backing runtimes, we were able to bring testable enterprise development to our application containers in a way that we hadn't before. Um, so I wrote a book alongside with my colleague Ashlak Knutsen. He is the project lead of Arkillian. Um, and it's this right here. So I hope to throw a bunch of information at you. I hope that we're going to talk about a bunch of things at a conceptual level. I'll show it running to you. To, prove that it works, at least in some fashion. And I'll hope that you can leave with two things. One is a, a couple of links and URLs to go visit on your own. And two is just an understanding that these things are possible. And the links will then, if you follow them and read, explain how you can go implement it on your own later. Make sense? So the book is this. It's called Continuous Enterprise Development in Java. It's being published through O'Reilly, and it will be available in print within the coming weeks. We've already sent it off to the printer. Um, the neat thing about this book is that we've written it with an open source license. It has a Creative Commons license. And if you take a look over here at this little tab that says Fork Me on GitHub, and were to open that, you'd see um, that the book in its entirety, alongside all of the back and code examples, are up here and running. Um, so we have a system, in fact, where you can go and start at the forward and read about that. Um, you can fork the repository on your own. In fact, we hope that you do because all of the code is under this uh, code aptly named um, directory um, where you can go and, and, then, and then build and run on your own to see that what we're talking about is sort of self-proving. Uh, in addition to all of that, um, what we do is we build one cohesive application in this book. And um, the application is running on OpenShift. Uh, sometimes it goes to sleep a little bit. Um, so we will, we'll wake it up right now. Um, but the application is running on OpenShift. And what we do is we have this process whereby every commit to the code gets pushed into a continuous integration server, which will run all of the tests. 
Uh, and from there, when the tests come clear, we'll push it to OpenShift, and uh, it goes live here. So um, I think maybe we'll just kind of dig in. Um, when we started doing this testable enterprise development thing, the big thing at the time was, oh no, Java EE is testable. It's all POJOs, so you can do whatever you'd like. If you have a CDI bean or you have an EGB, there's no real programming model restrictions preventing you from building these however you'd like, and you can instantiate them on your own in your own tests and test them. And that was our view of testability a few years back. Um, it was my opinion that, no, that's really not testable. Can anyone tell me why I might have thought that EJBs, when you instantiate them and execute them, aren't really testing the EJBs? No container? No, no container. Yes. No I'm container. Sorry. No container, yeah. Um, EJBs become such only in the context of an EJB container. CDI beans become such only in the context of a CDI container. And it's not just the business logic that you're writing that you need to test. It's how all these components interact with one another that you need to test. So if I were to build a pipe from here uh, down into Nice, probably I wouldn't be just testing that the pipes had no leaks and then plug them together and expect the water to make it all the way from one end to another. I would probably want to, well yes, test the pieces that they were proper, and then as I were joining them, also have to test in piecemeal that, all right, sections one and two work well together, sections two and three, and then, you know, we can, we can piece together that way. So, um, we talk about integration testing at every level, and you have to interact with the container to take into account things like your injection points and the other services like security and transactions and make sure that these are all working at the correct levels at, as you expect in the context of the container. Your application is not just the code you write. In fact, the whole mission of Java EE is to have you writing less and getting powerful services for it. So when you write an application, in truth, that ends up being a very tiny fraction of the amount of code that is actually comprising your application when you use the container. So, um, anyone has used Archelion before at all? Nice. We have a clean slate. Ashlag did a presentation here last week, last year. Oh yeah? yeah. Cool. So you may remember Ashlag if you were here last year for that. He would have been the tall shockingly white Norwegian one with the thick accent. Um, let's dig in a little bit. Um, I like to start perhaps um, at what we call chapter five. Chapter five, the, the book will have a bunch of introductory and expository chapters at the beginning. Here's what we're trying to do. Here are some of the technologies we'll be using. We're gonna dig in right here. The book builds one application. The application is called GeekSeek. It is kind of like Lanyard. If anyone's ever used Lanyard, this is a conference tracker that allows you to say that you're attending a conference or say that you're speaking at a conference and track which sessions you want to go to, and it does so in kind of a social way. We built a very similar service and we called it GeekSeek because it is a cohesive application with a data model all the way up to the UI, and we didn't want to build a book that was talking about how to make CDI beams or how to make EJB or how to use servlets because as a developer you end up using all of these things probably and you want to see how they interact. So each chapter tries to address kind of one major use case. Um, the use case for this chapter deals with persistence uh, and relational data and what we need to do um, as you might expect is store our conference information and venue information and user information and be able to store them, perform operations on them, and retrieve them. Has anyone ever tried to test with data before? Do we test at all? Like, what, where are we? Where are we at the like, on the testing spectrum, where are we here? Maybe not so much. Manual testing when it's all done, you have a web application and kind of click through. That's cool. And, and that's really very common. They're shy. 
that I, I'm getting that, like a little bit. In, in Paris, they were like very right? angry. It's like I, it's I'm, I'm sure they test, right? right? Sure, yeah. Maybe there's more wine there. Or something. Uh, so um, let's do a little background first. I want to walk everyone through the um, anatomy of uh, an Archelian test. And you'll excuse me that I don't have my hello world examples here. We're going to be, we're, we're shooting with real bullets. Uh, we're going to start off with some real stuff, okay? But an Archelian test, despite how complex and involved these are, these test cases are meant to showcase the most difficult things to test, so they'll inherently be a little bit longer. But I'll outline some things for you. An Archelian test, just like the Java EE programming model, is based on POJOs. So here we see that we've just created our own class, and it's called conference test case. We denote that this is an Archelian-based test using the run with annotation and passing it the Archelian test runner. The run with annotation is a standard JUnit annotation that allows you to say, hey, instead of using the standard JUnit block for test runner, which is implicit and default, we're going to hand control to Archelian. Archelian is just a test adapter between your JUnit lifecycle and doing stuff. Anything. We built it to be pluggable, we built it to be modular and extensible. So once Archelian has control, it can do all sorts of things. What we do with it in a Java EE sense is we'll say, okay, we've got a new test. First we're going to start up a container or connect to it like a Wildfly or an EAP. We're going to deploy something into it and we can also do all sorts of things like injections and provide other services into the test. In short, this is basically giving us the Java EE programming model, but for testing. Right? Uh, the test becomes itself a managed component. And you'll notice here that if we take a look at the import statements, of which there are a few, um, nowhere in here is there an org.wildfly, meaning that we're, we're not going to actually um, have any code in this test that involves starting the container or deploying into it. That's all abstracted away from you. You need to just focus on your test logic. So to denote an Archelian test, we say we run with Archelian. Archelian, when it gets control, will in turn see if there are any uh, container adapters available on the class path. In this case, uh, we're using a Maven build. The container adapter available to us is the one for JBoss EAP. So that knows that it's going to be connecting into EAP and deploying into it. So we note that it's an Archelian test. Then we define a deployment. And we define a deployment very simply with this. This is the deployment annotation. And it goes upon a method that returns any type of a shrink wrap archive. Shrink wrap is a project which is a virtual file system that represents archives. So when you think about how the deployment model, the deployment model in Java EE works, we typically have our classes, our source files, our other assets, we run a build, it compiles everything, um, and then when that build is done being run, we package it all together and we serialize it into a file. Once we have that file, we can deploy it into an application server, which will then read in the stuff that we just serialized and deploy it. Here we're skipping a few steps. Okay? We're in an IDE, when you hit save, you have incremental compilation, meaning you've already got the class files that you need. All you need is some way to package them together in some sort of a structure and represent it to the container as something that it can read in and deploy. We do that right here. And because this is all picked up right here uh, in a runtime fashion, we have the classes available, that means that our development cycle becomes code, test, there's an error with the test, fix the code, run the test again immediately. Just like that, no running the build on the, in, the, in the interim. Also, because Archelian is implemented with this standard JUnit annotation, it means that you don't need any other plugins. You don't need a Maven plugin. You don't need an IDE plugin. You don't need anything special or particular. Uh, anything that can run JUnit, Ant, Gradle, Maven, the continuous integration environment, will run it just the same way with your standard run as JUnit test. Your execution environment doesn't need to know Archelian's behind the scenes. It's just executing a JUnit test, that's its entry. 
So there's our kind of background and what we're trying to do with Archelion. Let's see how we can use it to test data. Um, when we test data, this chapter starts to, I, I lie out the, um, the implementation a bit, so we'll skip by that, assuming that we're all kind of familiar with JPA a little bit. Good, Java EE developers. Sweet. Um, we scroll down and I talk a little bit about the test setup um, and what we need to do. Um, a little bit too far. When it comes to testing data, we really are a few things. Uh, they can be difficult to do on our own and they can be time consuming. We're going to show you some ways to eliminate that. The first thing to do with testing data is probably to put your database in some sort of a known state. Right? This is your kind of precondition operation that you need to do. You say, okay, I'm going to be starting to test my business logic operations. I better put my database into a state that's going to seed it with some initial data. Then we'll perform our operations on it. And when our operations are done, we need to do our post condition checks, our assertions, which is basically validating that the data is now in an expected state and it's changed as it's supposed to change. Right? If we were to write all of that on our own, they might involve pulling in scripts from somewhere. They may involve doing a bunch of manual things to put the database in a known state. Um, what we do um, uh, is we'll employ a technique where we take externalized data files, we'll pre-populate the database with the externalized data files, and we'll do that in a declarative way, just with an annotation. Then we'll run our, we'll run our test logic, and when we're done, we'll have it validate against another set of data files, which will represent what we expect it to look like. So then we make it actually kind of easy to do that. There are another few things that we need to think about when we deal with data, uh, and that is transactions. Relational databases are typically transactional, um, unless you're using like a MyISM for a MySQL or something. How, how we're using transactional data sources here. So we're familiar with the ACID properties of a transactional database. Um, we can do a couple of things with our test methods. We can commit them at the end of the test method so that the changes get flushed and available for other test methods to see. We can run our changes and then ditch the transaction so that there's no permanence to anything that we do, and that way they're able to work in isolation. Or we can disable transactions entirely and just kind of work on our own. So those are the three modes that we've got with the Archelian persistence extension. Let's take a look at what we've got. Uh, we've noted that we've got the conference test case, and this is an Archelian test. We've noted the deployment, and in the deployment we say that, all right, shrink wrap, create us a web archive, put a bunch of stuff into it. This is what Archelian will deploy for us for our test. We've got a bunch of other stuff in here. We want to be able to listen in on events, so we'll set some flags to see that we've got created and removed events, and we'll clear them up uh, in the after method. We can also do injections in Archelian. So we're going to inject what we call um, our repository. And this repository is an object that we've made that represents how we interact with the database. It's something we've built for the application. This should look pretty familiar to anyone who's ever dealt with CRUD operations, right? We've got your create, you've got your remove, um, and you've got your get. And update, uh, obviously, if you're familiar with JPA, is done automatically for you as the entity manager, um, like monitors the transaction, and synchronizes changes alone. So um, this is our abstraction above the entity manager, and this is how we deal with entities. Um, we'll inject this, and that's how we'll interact with our conference repositories, simply by injecting it. This is our first test right here. And we, this is the story. As a user, I should be able to create a conference. And we say, conference, let's make a new conference, and we use it using this create conference method, which is very simple, it just kind of says, Make a new conference, it's going to be called DevOps Belgium, it's going to have a duration, and we'll return it. So we do that. And now that we've got our conference, we'll call in the repository store op operation, and we'll also assert that the created event was fired for us. That's one assertion. Here's the other assertion. Should match data set is part of the Archelian persistence extension, and it will actually check after we've created the conference, 
does the database contain the stuff located in this conference YAML file? It doesn't have to be YAML, it could be XML, it can be kind of separated values. Uh, the YAML file uh, ends up being kind of my preferred way for defining what data looks like because uh, if I can show you what the format looks like. There we go. Uh, that'll be the format of our YAML file. So we can define our data in that format, seems kind of easy to read, um, and that's what the uh, type checker, not the type checker, what the uh, the Archelian persistence extension will then perform our assertions based on, so you don't have to write your own assertions. Uh, and we've got a bunch of tests like this, like creating a conference. We should be able to create a conference and associate it with a session. So we'll create a conference, we'll create a session, and then we'll draw a relationship between the two and store it and then make sure that we match the data set for both the conference YAML file and the session YAML file. We can do this, which is we should be able to add a session to conference. Well, first, we're going to seed the database with some initial data, and that's what the using data set annotation will do. It'll take everything in that file, put it into the database before the test executes, then we run our test logic, and then uh, we make sure that it should match the data set. There's a lot going on here, but it's really only this three lines of code that we're, you know, that is making up the bulk of our test logic, and we're getting all the assertions for free. So I find this to be a very powerful way of doing data-based uh, testing. And again, you kind of run it just like this, uh, your standard JUnit run as annotation. Um, and it'll run the test, and you see right here in your IDE, as you're used to, um, you'll see everything pass. This, by the way, is, is a full-scale integration test. It uses the container. It's done the deployment. It's sent everything along. Um, you can watch it execute. I have the server <coughs> kind of running right here. Uh, so we'll run the test and let it deploy, and you'll actually see that the server receives the deployment and executes a bunch of stuff. Um, and if you look really closely there, you can even see all the Hibernate type of calls that are being done. And then it quits and it shuts down, and that's it. It's a full-scale integration test. If you remember nothing else, it's our goal to give you the feeling of a unit test with the power of a full-scale integration test using the container. And you shouldn't have to write too much to have there be the difference, right? That's some testing with data. Before I move on, I've, I've got like two other examples of difficult to test things. Are we all kind of on board with this so far? Is there anything I can clear up first? Awesome. In JBoss, we have a saying, it's called silence means approval. So uh, we're just gonna roll with that, I suppose. Um, this is perhaps my favorite chapter. Business logic in the services layer. Um, I take what I believe is a very common use case and show how difficult and probably untested it normally is. When you create a new user, we send an email to that user. How do you test that? There are a few problems with it. One, you're interacting with some sort of an external service in by nature that it's an SMTP server. Two, uh, is that this is asynchronous. So has anyone ever done any type of testing with asynchronous type of operations? Yeah, I'd love to hear you know, the approaches you've taken to doing it. Testing asynchronous. Wait for the yeah. for the result. So you, you don't know if you, if you you need to continue to, to wait or, or if something goes wrong or not. Mm -hmm. so right. You need to to be able to know if your service is working or not or what happens. Right. Mm -hmm. So with an asynchronous operation, you kind of send along a message and then like wait, wait around and then send another message and you're like, hey, did that work? It works sometimes, it works most of the time. Um, when I was on the JBoss application server team, we had a, obviously a, a JMS subsystem, and JMS is all asynchronous. And our JMS subsystem had maybe 400 tests, and all of the tests did the same thing. We sent a message to a queue to do some processing. The, the test would thread sleep for 10 seconds and then send another message in 
just like I said, to see if it had completed properly. There were two major problems to this approach. One is that maybe it wasn't done processing and the server got some other request from another process and it just wasn't done doing its thing and we would get back a failure and it wasn't really a failure on the part of the JMS subsystem, there was a failure, it's a transient failure, it didn't really exist, so it would give us false negatives. Um, and any test run that we did, we would get back these false negatives and we'd have to look through and be like, all right, a bunch of tests are failing, but they're all, eh, they're all JMS tests, they're all gonna fail sometimes, maybe it'll work in the next run. So we, it threatened the stability of our build and we never got a clean build. The other big problem is when you have 400 tests that are all thread sleeping for 10 seconds. That's 4,000 seconds. Yeah, I'm good at math. 4,000 seconds of just sitting there doing nothing. Um, and that really adds to your test execution time. So you can imagine if you have 4,000 seconds of added time to your test suite, what the likelihood of your developers running the tests on their local machine is gonna be before they commit it up. Probably not that great, because no one's gonna wait around for a while for all that stuff to finish up before they commit their code. And this was before the days of Git, where we would like do branches and test that branch before merging it upstream. This was like all SVN. So everyone's pummeling the repo with all sorts of whatever changes they're making at any given time. And when we get test back, you know, test result back, who knows what broke it, right? Um, I think we can do better. I'll show you how we do. Archelion will take this test class. In addition to this deployment, which we define right here, Archelion will silently and a little sneakily take the test class and put it inside. And when we execute the test, it's actually done inside the server, inside the deployment. That's how we're able to do the injections in there, right? We can inject into it because it actually is a managed component by nature of it being inside the deployment. Inside the deployment, it's inside the process, and once we're inside the, the process and the deployment, that means we could take advantage of shared memory and use our Java concurrency utilities. So, what I'll do um, is, instead of relying upon a real, SMTP, a real SMTP server, this is a rare instance in which I'll advocate the use of a mock. So instead of using a real SMTP server, um, which is bound into JNDI, I will just take that same JND binding, but instead of pointing it to a real SMTP server, I'll make a test SMTP server that I control and I can listen to, and we'll put an event handler in that SMTP server so that we can listen in on when, when things are received. Um, I'll show you some of the code we use for this. Um, we've implemented this SMTP service as a message-driven beam, <coughs> I'm sorry, as an EJB. Um, and it's got this QMail for delivery method. Okay? <coughs> and the QMail for delivery method is because when I hit register, I don't necessarily want the user waiting to have the server connect to an SMTP server to send the mail. We'll just take all the metadata and put it on a JMS queue and be like, okay, you're asynchronous anyway. We'll put you on a JMS queue, return control to the user, and now we're good. And then whatever's listening on that JMS queue, that can be the thing which then goes to send the actual mail message and connect to the SMTP server. So that's going to be how we actually you know, connect it, and then I have a message-driven bean which listens in on the queue uh, and does the proper like unwrapping of the message and sends the mail. What we're going to do um, is, where did that class go? SMTP mail service test case. We're going to inject the mail service. This is the thing we use to send the mail. We'll inject our fake, our mock SMTP server service so that we control it and set handlers. Um, and we've got some other like configuration stuff which isn't really relevant to this talk, so we'll skip over that. This right here is the method we're talking about. We're gonna test an asynchronous component and it's called test SMTP async. We will define a body for the body of the mail message and we'll create what's called a cyclic barrier. Anyone familiar with cyclic barrier? I'd love for you to explain it. You're like the first person ever to raise their hand and say they are. Would you like to explain the cyclic barrier to us? It's synchronization of primitive. Sure. Uh, maybe not a primitive, but definitely a 
from Java Util Concurrent, uh, a higher level synchronization tool that we use. Um, it looks, sorry, camera, it looks a little bit like this. I like to use props. Thank you, Steph. Say this right here is our cyclic barrier. Okay? Um, I'm going to initialize it in the constructor with a level of two, meaning that it's going to stay up as a wall until one, two things arrive. When two things arrive, it will then clear and let them pass through and then reset itself. That's a cyclic barrier. So we're going to do the same thing uh, right here in code. And we're going to first say, all right, SMTP server service, we're going to set the handler. We're going to define the behavior of what you do when you, as an SMTP server, receive a message. Uh, first, we're going to perform an assertion that the message received that the message has the same contents that we're expecting. Make sure that the metadata came through okay, and we're sending out the right uh, data. Then we're going to have um, the SMTP server service wait on the barrier. Okay, that's that'll be the handling for this. So this will probably be the second thing here. So if that's our server service, that'll be this guy right here. Now we've set the handler. Once we've set up the handler, we can probably so we'll construct a new mail message, and we'll say mail service, queue mail for delivery. Put it on the JMS queue and let it go. And then the test is immediately going to wait on this barrier. So the test is coming along. It sends the mail message, and it goes and it waits on the barrier. And then uh, a whole bunch of stuff in the background as it gets put on the JMS queue. The message-driven bean picks it up. The message-driven bean unwraps the message, sends it along over to the SMTP server service, which is sitting here. This thing gets executed, validates the result, and then it says, okay, I'm ready to wait on the barrier too. And at that point, we've got our two people here. This thing can clear, the test can go through, uh, and that's it. So now we've got a mechanism by which we can reliably uh, have an asynchronous component, test it, and not have to wait um, any longer than it takes for these messages to be received, and the test goes through kind of like this. And I'll show you what this looks like. When we run it, uh, we run this test, run as JUnit test, just like we did before. We see all this go through, configures the mail service, it sends the message, and oh, where am I? Yeah, and we see that it's green right here. And I can run this all day long. Um, I'd actually like to show you something else to give you a sense of the workflow here. This is the SMTP server service. Um, here's the send mail message where we actually send the mail. Let's say I'm going through and I accidentally comment this out just with a stupid keystroke and I don't mean to do that uh, as I'm testing and I go to run my test again. Um, you'll see that all I did is like I made the change, I hit save, and then I reran the test. And now you'll see that it's going to like wait for the maximum timeout probably not get the result we want and show that this has now failed. And I can go, oh, that's really stupid of me. What did I just do? Oh yeah, I was just in here. I see what I did. I'll go, I'll click save, and then I'll run the test again, um, and it goes. That's kind of the development type of uh, cadence that we should be having at all times. It's the same way a JUnit test is, only like we've got a whole EJB going, we're interacting with backend services, whatever, but all we did is you know, hit save, and once we've enabled you to write tests and execute them in such a quick way, you'll be writing them, uh, you'll be running them a lot more on your own, you'll be running them every single time you maybe make a change or change a file, you can keep on doing it and catch your errors a lot more quickly rather than at the end of finishing a feature or doing a whole run. That's the kind of experience we're trying to give to you with this. So um, I'm, I'm glad I showed that. Um, yes. So in this uh, example, does the client get any notification that uh, the mail has been sent? Because it's an uh, async task, so mm -hmm. he should wait for a notification no? that it's been sent and it's okay. Right. You know? So um, what we could do, um, what we could do for this test, if we were to like really do it again. Um, this, I mean, again, keep in mind that this book was written to be like, show you how to do yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, and also have the constraint that um, like had to be something you could pull from a repository, run, and everything would all work. Yeah. 
uh, if I were doing this uh, at like my job at a corporation, probably what I would do is instead of having the, the test SMTP service, I would actually let it go through to a full SMTP service um, and swap out the address for something that then sent a real mail message into another, uh, like, in, like a, an IMAP server, mm -hmm. and then have like um, an inflow adapter, probably a message driven mean inflow adapter, to then be like, oh, I've received a new message, and then that would be my notification yeah. in, and it would close the pipe entirely. Mm -hmm. That's, that's probably what I would do. Yeah. But, um, you know, with the book and the repo, we can't distribute the whole <laughs> chain there necessarily. Okay. So we'll get to most of the way there, and hopefully you think enough to ask that question, and then, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, so that's it's like testing some asynchronous <laughs> services. Uh, there's one more example I'd love to show you. That involves... Um, <clears throat> We've done user interface testing. Anyone testing the UI? Tough to do. A little bit. Click, click. I like that. That, by the way, uh, goes, that's all languages. Just like the universal sign for like testing in the click, click. I know, I know companies who let users do the testing, right? We, you know what? I've heard that. that. that, that pushes everything on prod. Yeah, and then they have a bot monitoring uh, Twitter, and if a lot of people mention GitHub, they automatically revert. <laughs> That's exactly what they said in Paris too. They were like, they do. "Yeah, we test in production. If like the, the users will let us know if there's a problem, <laughs> or, or maybe they use uh, Amazon Turk." You know? That's how they oh, test yeah, they Linux as well. On, you know, Amazon yeah. Turk. 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 Amazon yeah, Turks. Turk. It's a it's a service uh, from Amazon that uh, actually mechanical Turk. Yeah, mechanical Turk is uh, real name. Oh, uh, cool. They actually hire people from I don't know what countries. It doesn't matter. And they actually show you as a client uh, show you a box where you can click if this is a uh, picture with a dog or with a cat, you know, and you have to click on you know, and that's the testing part. It could be also for you know. Um, Stuff like that's UI basically. Oh, cool. Or services that you have to click on it. So basically, manual uh, testing. Amazon Tor is Tor it Torque? Uh, yeah, like Torque. 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 Mechanical Torque. Me mechanical mechanical Torque. 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 Yeah, the idea is that uh, that mechanical Torque is a like a robot that is basically a person inside, yeah. you know, and it's doing all the, all the work for you. Know, work, yeah, but it's inside the box. So. Years back, I had a. Um, <laughs> It was like a it was a testing machine. Uh, you would use it as a proxy. So like, I had my machine, I had my web server, but then I would set up my browser to use this thing as a proxy. Mm -hmm. And so I would like hit this through there, and it would capture all of my clicks and all my inputs, um, and then like kind of record a macro. Mm -hmm. And then on this machine, if you can figure, it'll be like, okay, do exactly what I did right there, but do it for ten thousand users and like. Yeah. That yeah, was, that was used in uh, most of the. Mm, how can I say it? Uh, clicking at on ads, you know, on yeah. websites. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> chest test. It was a stress testing thing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting yeah. money for. Don't plug in for. Uh, don't plug in for Selenium that's doing this for you. I'm sorry. A plug in for Firefox. Yes. And um, you can do it with uh, plug in Selenium, and you you click everywhere you want, and it's um, recording all your clicks. Records all your and macros for Firefox and. Then that's yeah, that's great. So you could just on your own, like make up your test plan and then continue to run it. Um, again, I think we can do a little bit better. Although I think that like anyone who thinks at all about user interface stuff is already like off to a good start. We're familiar with the Selenium project. Yeah, that's that's what he was meant. Oh, that, oh, yeah. but it was a plugin for Firefox. You said yes. To record the the actions. Oh, to record yeah. the actions and Another then go for right the I see. So, I mean, here we, we integrate with Selenium uh, in Arcillion. We have the Selenium extension, which is called uh, Drone, right there. So what we do, uh, again, we just have a standard Arcillion test. Um, Arcillion will set up and instantiate Selenium and run it for us. And uh, we execute um, you know, via the Drone web driver right there, which ends up being our hook into the browser. Um, so we got a test right here. Um, I won't bore you with the, the setup of it, but the book does explain 
how we get this. Yeah. Have you ever hit the limit in the length of uh, the method name? <laughs> no. no. We're very descriptive. Again, like it's a book, like I wouldn't necessarily like. And actually, uh, you can blame. Um, yeah, you can, you can blame the, the silly Norwegian for this particular method right here. <laughs> Should show error message on missing dates in conference form. But it tells you what it does. We're going to create a new conference. Only we're not going to give the conference a start and an end date, and we're going to submit it. And basically, what we want to see is that the start and the end date fields then have like little red uh, bits next to them. Actually, is this thing running? It is. Is this thing working? OpenShift sometimes uh, we have to upgrade our gears. There's like small gears and medium gears and like big gears. Uh, this ends up being fine for this. I have to upgrade us so that it doesn't like go to sleep and then like, I have to wake it up. All right, we'll come back to that in a second. I don't care if it works as long as the tests pass. Well, the, yeah, I mean the tests, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what we'll do here is we'll, you know, we're going to use Selenium through Archelion and we'll say, um, we inject right here, we inject this main page object which describes uh, our page for us. And we can say page, get action links, which will be all of our a, you know, links. Um, and we'll make sure that we have a link called conference. And once we got the link called conference, we'll click it. Um, and after that, we'll be able to grab the conference form to create a new conference for us as it's displayed to us and fill out in the form the name and fill out the tagline, but we're not going to fill out the start date and the end date. And then we'll submit the form. Then we can perform our assertions uh, to make sure that we have no errors on the name and the tagline, but we do have errors on the start and the end. Um, and that's how we do UI testing. We build up an object model to represent uh, the components on the page that we want to interact with. We interact with them on code, uh, and then we execute this. Again, um, this thing still seems to be waiting. Um, again, what's neat is this is going to run just like any other JUnit test. Same way as we did before, we will execute it. Um, it'll deploy the whole thing, send it in there, run the tests for us, and Selenium has this notion of like backing uh, drivers that you can use. In this case, um, we see right here, what does it say? PhantomJS is launching the Ghost driver. We use the PhantomJS driver because it works headless. PhantomJS is a web browser. It's a web browser that shows you nothing. It shows you absolutely nothing. But it gives you, it does render the page, it renders it, it just renders it on its own, and then um, we can kind of be able to do uh, our testing based on that. If I, there's a config file in here somewhere. Um, I, I should have thought to like put that up. I can actually change that. There's just one line in the config file where it says PhantomJS, and if I type Chrome instead, then when I run this test, as I just did, uh, instead of PhantomJS, Chrome will pop up. You'll see it. You'll see it fill in all the forms, fill out, and it's done much quicker than anyone would be able to. But the beauty of this is that you don't have to run it. There's no human error. It's going to execute much quicker than a human will. And you can run it with your continuous integration every single time, and it lives forever, rather than having a QE person maybe only test before, as you're about to release or something catch your errors just as quickly as you can. So those are, I don't know, three of the use cases that I find very difficult. And uh, when we first started talking about Archelion, we showed, hey, here's how to test an EJB, and here's how to echo with an EJB, and here's how to test a servlet. And people were like, yeah, that's really cool. And very quickly, we're like, I build real world applications. I have some difficult things to test. How am I going to do it? This book is about testing the most difficult to test things that have historically been tough for us. So. I would advise you, if you're interested, to go check out the book, read it. It's all free. Send us notes on Twitter. Um, this is me right here. I'm at A.L. Rubinger, and my name is Andrew Rubinger. And, um, you know, this, this to me is how we should really be doing development, because if, if you just throw it over the wire and don't test everything, then we're maybe not even knowing what we're missing, and we catch our errors reported by our users in, in production on Twitter, uh, which may be fine for some things. Uh, if you work for a bank, I don't think they think that, oh, we'll, we'll test this new trading system. 
And if people call us and say that they're missing money, well, then we'll know that we need to fix something. Yeah, we can, I mean, we can keep going. I've got, um, anyone I'm using NoSQL yet? Yeah. Actually, no, I want to talk about something else. I don't know. There's, there's a couple of things that, before a run starts, I think I'd really like to discuss, if that's okay with you, and you can let me know where you are in this. There are a few things that we talk about um, that, that are like common topics at conferences, and people get very ramped up about them, and they're very interesting, and then I come to find that they maybe don't know what these things are, or what they represent, or why they're important. Um, so lately I've been on this like modularity type rant lecture, which I'd like to subject you to, if that's okay. Um, unless you understand, is, have we heard about this debate for Java modularity? I can rant about that for hours if you want. He can, I mean, well, we, Ceylon, which you know, Steph works on, has been built to be modular from like its very core, right? So, um, do we know really what we're talking about when we talk about Java modularity and why that's important? Go, go right ahead. So you can add a, a very small uh, GRE if you have a modularity. You don't have to to load uh, the whole uh, uh, job. Sure. Yeah, you, you don't have to load the whole thing. You can. When we talk modularity, modularity is an overloaded term. When I develop software, I develop it in modules, and then I couple them together. When I talk about Java modularity, usually what we're talking about is class loading, right? Um, and, you know, Arun is going to talk in a little bit about Wildfly and about EAP. Starting with JBoss AS7, we built it based upon a modular class loading architecture. And a lot of times I'm finding people are just kind of looking, they'll immediately say, oh, is that OSGI? Or is that you know, OSGI compatible? And while OSGI is an example of a modular class loading system, there's also a entire specification, it ends up being much more. So I just would like to maybe outline, like, describe what the problem with modularity is. Java class loading works in a hierarchical fashion. Class loading in Java is based on a parent-child model. So uh, at the very beginning, at the very top, um, I built this little test. This will be just like uh, a fun time in, in Java class loading for all of us, I suppose. Um, at the very top, we have um, a bootstrap class loader. This is the first class loader that, that starts up, and it brings in a bunch of our like system classes. Okay, and from there, um, and by the way, the terminology totally differs based upon what you're reading or if you're reading the docs in the JDK API. Um, but under that. You know, you'll have a, a bootstrap class loader. Um, I'm sorry, after the bootstrap class loader, you have what they'll call like a system class loader or an application class loader. And this is what is kind of, uh, when you launch a Java process, the dash dash class path, all that stuff goes into there. And then below that, you'll have another class loader. And in the case of application servers, we will make a class loader of like for the server. And then maybe each subsystem will like have a class loader. And then below that, when you issue your deployment, it will get its own class loader. So, let's say you're building a, an EJV jar, right? And your EJV jar uh, uses Hibernate. And you use kind of a new version of Hibernate. So, you compile your classes against this new version, and maybe you uh, use some new feature of Hibernate that came out just in this version that you're using. So your code is compiled against this version and then in your EJV jar, you put your Hibernate jar inside of your deployment and then you deploy that into the server. If you don't have modular class loading, here's what happens. The delegation model for the hierarchical class loading structure is parent first. So what it will do uh, is it will then load your deployment, load your classes, and when your classes reference out to the Hibernate stuff, we'll load in and it'll say, hey, load me this Hibernate class. And it will first, because it's parent first, ask the parent if it has it, and if not, ask the parent, and ask the parent until it gets all the way up to the one that's in the server class loader, 
because obviously we have an application server which is a provider for JPA and Hibernate is the JPA provider and now you're pulling in a version from up here that the server defined, not the same version that you put in with your deployment there. And this works not just for Hibernate, for logging is a really common example, any library that may be shared anywhere else, that's how this works. You'll get a no such method error if you call upon a method that is here but not here. You'll get some sort of a linkage problem. Any sorts of unpredictable behaviors that you will only get and you will only get them like at runtime or maybe class load time depending upon the nature of the error. Enter modularity. Oh, it's perfect. Thank you very much. Modularity says, okay, um, we can't really change how the class loader API is, but we can change how it works. Um, so uh, instead of doing this delegation model, which goes parent first, by the way, um, web archives by the servlet spec, that's child first. So that's another thing that may be really confusing to you. If you have a bunch of EJBs and you had put them in a jar in an ear and then you change it uh, to a WAR structure, and now you're actually calling different classes because the WAR is child first, not parent first. These are the kind of gotchas that exist within Java EE. So um, in a modular class loading environment, what we'll do is we'll actually give you a class loader for your deployment, and that class loader will not see anything else unless we explicitly define it, with one exception. Um, in JBoss uh, Application Server 7 and in Wildfly, we let you see the Java EE API. That's it. Um, so your deployment isn't going to leak out. And if you want to be able to depend on things from other deployments, or you want to be able to depend on something from inside the server, you have to use metadata to draw an explicit link from here to there. Um, so here's a little test that I've kind of thrown together. Um, it shows various class loaders. This is like an ultra simple class. This is just some class that I wrote called class loaders yesterday while like at the airport with a room and it's got a main method could not be any more simple we've got this class name um, and we're going to try and load this class name this class name uh, is something that's provided by IntelliJ when we launch and it's on it's in the class path so first we'll say uh, all right we've got a thread context class loader the thread context class loader is something that you can set or get um, and you can set it to kind of whatever you want, and it adds a default. It's uh, set up to whatever uh, the bootstrap class loader is, I think. We'll see in this test. Um, we have the class loader, which loaded this class, which we get by saying, you know, our current class, get the class loader. We've got the system class loader, which we get by getting the system class loader method. And then just for fun, I said, all right, like, what's the class loader that loaded java.lang.string? Because that'll definitely be the bootstrap class loader, because they're pulled in from rt.jar. How is your class called? I'm sorry? Uh, my class is called class loaders. So, so this is Oh, actually, that's wrong. You're right. Thanks. Good. And it's lowercase l. Yeah. Thank you. It's a static method, so I couldn't... Normally, I would do like this dot class dot... Thank you. Um, so if I were to run this main method, um, oh, I've got some more class loaders I want to show you too. Um, after these class loaders which are kind of provided to us, the one on the thread, the one of this class, the system class loader, and then the class loader that loaded string, I've also created a couple other ones for funsies. Um, here we're going to make a new URL class loader. URL class loader says, it, it extends secure class loader and it just lets you point to a URL pointing to maybe some jars or something and it'll make a class loader that can load in those jars. Uh, in this case we won't point it to any jars but we'll use the no argument constructor and we'll say uh, make us a new URL class loader that really points to nothing else. Um, and it'll have no parent because we don't give it a parent. Then we'll make a URL class loader in the same fashion but give it an explicit parent of the thread context class loader. And finally we will make a URL class loader uh, and we'll give it an explicit parent and the explicit parent will be null. 
So when we run this, um, we get some output, and we'll see what we get. First of all, we see that the thread context class loader is this thing called Sun Mist Launcher app class loader. This is the application class loader that's provided uh, by the Sun JDK. And when we use it to try and load uh, at main, you, we see that we actually get it. We have the class loader which loaded this class. Again, uh, the application class loader because our class right here is on the dash dash class path. We get the application class loader. Um, System, system class loader. Um, again, this word like system class loader, it's not necessarily what I would call it, just because it's really the application class loader. Again, the dash dash class path. So when we say get system class loader, it'll give us the same one. I call it the application class loader. A lot of other people do too. Because um, I feel like the word system class loader sometimes uh, really refers to this one right here. When we try and get the class loader that loaded string, see this? The class loader which loaded string comes up as null. Because by spec uh, in the API, it says that if you're going to denote this, the class loader that loaded anything on rt.jar, in a JVM specific way, in a vendor specific way, you may return null for that. So it's not that there's no class loader which loaded, str which loaded string. One did, it's just allowed to give you null. And that's how the API works. Here's the interesting bit for me. The class loader with no parent um, gets an implicit parent, and that's the current one. So if you give no parent as an argument, it'll give you your current one, um, and you'll actually be leaking from any class loader you make unless you give it you'll get polluted class path all the way up to the top when you create a new class loader like this. Um, it gets interesting here when you say the URL class loader with null parent, if you explicitly give a new class loader, loader a null parent, then you'll see right here, could not find com application at main. This is the mechanism by which we can properly isolate class loaders. By giving it a null parent, then we isolate it out, it doesn't have visibility, and it's not polluted with everything that's on the class path, and that's the primary building block upon which we can make modular class loading, by first isolating it from everything else, and then overriding the search behavior to only look for things we explicitly tell us. Yes? You want to know a fun fact about a URL class loader? Yes. If you give it a URL to a jar, yeah. it will build an index of the jar and keep it around forever. <coughs> so if you drop the oh, URL right. class loader, make another class loader that points to the same jar, and you updated the jar with new code, you'll not see it. The index stays around forever, though, yes. but not the... The index stays forever, right. and so the content stays also forever unless you using reflection, enter the class and clear it yourself. Spooky stuff. Class loader API ends up, you know, it's one of those things where like, Java always has to be backwards compatible and maybe one of those like design decisions that was done very early on back in the day, class loading is like a dark art. Um, so anyway, the reason I bring all this up is because we talk about introducing modular class loading in Wildfly and in EAP6 and in, in JBoss AS7. And it's important uh, for a couple reasons. One is the isolation, which we just mentioned, but also two, the second you hit enter on starting up the application server, the first thing, the very first thing it's gonna do is start to run the code, and before it can run anything, it has to do class loading. So it ends up being a hot spot of activity, and if the class loading is not efficient, then it's gonna slow down the whole thing. When we wrote the modular class loading layer, we did it in such a way that it was meant to be highly concurrent. It's a concurrent class loading engine that's very efficient and we remove locks wherever possible. Standard Java class loading has a lot of synchronized blocks all over the place and the second you do that, yes, you need it for the security, um, but uh, it slows things down. Um, so we, we've got a, a much faster mechanism in place and that's how we're, we're able to, in JBoss AS7 or Wildfly or EAP, start up in like three or four seconds. It's called uh, JBoss Modules. It's called JBoss Modules. is the name of our modular class loading system, JBoss Modules. Cool.
professorial lecture. Thank you for bearing with me on that. Uh, do you want to take a break now? Or? Yeah, I got a yeah. asynchronous notification two minutes ago. There you go. Thank you. On a personal note, I have to say, I, I love France. I've been eating my face off here. Um, and we came in on the train earlier today. It was like the Riviera, Riviera? Just a beautiful, beautiful. I don't understand how any of you do your jobs uh, or like go to work or care to learn about anything. When there's like a beach, a con, and like all that. It's um, awesome seeing you. So thanks for having us. And uh, Arun will be up after lunch, and we'll come hang out for a bit, OK? Thank you.